Okay, let's have a closer look at all the features and functions of the ever-tasty Dragonfin Soup. This is the title screen. It contains all of your main options. You can use your touch controls, your keyboard, mouse, or joypad. You can scroll through the menu options with your keyboard or use the mouse wheel or your finger if you have a touch screen. First one is the story mode. Then we have survival mode, where you basically progress from one dungeon to another. And this is completable, but does contain permadeath. This is Endless Labyrinth. This mode is not completable, but you continue through a labyrinth until you eventually die. It's still fun though, trust me. Then we have the high scores, both online and off. The next is options. This is the game options and setting where you can configure everything. Read or die contains the manual and how you found this video. And then we have the credits. Let's have a closer look at the options. The first one is the language settings. The game is by default in English, but we do have five other languages. Let's switch to Japanese for fun test. Now everything is in Japanese. Okay, let's switch back and do English for the rest of the video. The next option is the auto attack option, which is off by default. You can turn it back on if you would like, but by using your movement keys, you will attack everything. It can get pretty annoying. Then we have the log lines. You can increase them if you want. The log lines are the text you see on the HUD on the left. Then we have the background volume and the sound effects volume. Safe attack is on by default. If you turn it off, then clicking on objects with the mouse will automatically attack them. Prompts can be turned off, such as the confirmation for entering a house or a shop or crafting and just a bunch of other annoying stuff. The kicker text is the text that will appear above my head or the foe's head when they take damage. You can make it larger if you have some difficulty reading it. Then we have the resolution and the display select if you're rocking multiple computer screens. Some of the settings will require you to restart the game, so if you change these options or others, you're gonna have to quit the game and then come back in. Then we have full screen and shaders. If you have graphical glitches that are really obvious, like floating textures and a bunch of other weird shit, then turn the shaders off. Then we have the texture quality. If you have lower specs on your hardware, and need to improve performance. V-Sync you can use if you have problems with the screen tearing in full screen. Overscan correction you will usually not need on a PC, but if you're trying to be super rad and hook up to a TV, sometimes the HUD elements are cropped and with overscan you can adjust the position of the HUD. You should be able to move the elements closer to the center, but you really shouldn't have to if most HDMI outputs and TVs will fix this problem for you. Some CPUs may have issues with the separate loading thread, so you can turn this off if you're getting random crashes during loading. Here, you can turn off the touch controls if you've got a touch screen. Here, you can turn off the mouse wheel. And you can turn off the camera zoom in game. Some people seem to have connected devices that create some really weird inputs. You can fix that here. Here we have a map zoom and the mini map zoom you can turn off as well. And here, here you can delete all the other characters you've unlocked because you know, smart shit. Now that we're done with all the stupid ass boring shit, let's talk about me. So this is story mode and you can start a new game or you can continue from a previous save. If you start a new game, you will have two options, classic and hardcore. Hardcore mode is basically the same as classic, but it features permadeath, which means if you fuck up and kill me, your save will be obliterated. There are two characters that can be played in story mode. The second one you're gonna have to unlock. The universe name is the seed of the game. So if you're using a different name, you will randomize everything in that game. You can also use the random button if you don't like the names that we've created or if you don't have any creativity and think of anything for yourself. Then we have survival mode. 
is pretty similar. You can continue and have a new game. You can save during survival mode, but it has permadeath. In survival mode and labyrinth mode, you can play as seven different characters that have to be unlocked. Don't worry guys, we're not complete assholes. You can unlock these characters just by playing the game. So there's no extra DLC or microtransactions. Here we have the Universe Seed 2. You can use a random one if you want, but if you want to be super cool and participate in the online rankings, you have to use the seed of that week to participate in said rankings. The settings for the Endless Labyrinth are pretty much the same. You have a new game, you can continue, and you can select between seven characters. Then of course you have a universe seed you can randomize or if you want to participate in the online challenge you use the online seed provided for that week. Alright, now let's look at how you can move me around in game. First up is the keyboard. You can use the keyboard keys, the arrow keys, and fun fact, I can move diagonally. You can use the joypad as well, and you can move around with an analog stick. Alright, so now that you know that I can move diagonally, here's a little secret. My enemies cannot, so use this to your advantage. If you play with a mouse, all you have to do is click on the tile and I will walk that way. It's very simple. However, and most excitingly, there's a new feature. If you press and hold the mouse, you can move around and you will see exactly the path I can walk. You can adjust the path accordingly to where you want me to go and it shows you where I cannot walk. Getting me to talk to other characters is also super easy. You just have to click on them, and I will automatically start walking towards them, and we'll strike up a dialogue. Safe attack is set to safe, so by clicking on something, I will only walk towards it and stop. If, however, you heathen, turned off the safe attack, not only will I walk up to the object, but I will start attacking it. But, if you stand on the tile next to whatever you want me to attack, even if the safe option is on, I will start attacking it. Clicking and holding on me allows you to rotate in place by dragging in a direction. You can also use the keyboard by holding space and using the directional keys. Or you can use an analog stick on a joypad. For touch controls, you just press and hold onto me and then move your finger around to change the orientation of where you would like me to move. Sometimes in combat, we're going to have to make some really precise movements, and it can be difficult with a joypad or keyboard. However, there is a fun little feature where we can make a single precise step. On a joypad, you will press the cancel back button and hold it, and then choose a direction. On a keyboard, you press shift and it will do the same. It will also indicate where I can and cannot walk. It's very useful in combat where we don't want to make a mistake and I don't want to walk on a trap or anything too far because, you know, I could die and that sucks. At the top, we have the day and night counter. As you can see, whenever you make a step or an attack, the counter will go up and subsequently the turn will be passed. The game is turn-based, however, Rotating me does not count as a turn. You can skip a turn by pressing R3 L3 on a joypad, the X period or number pad 5 key on the keyboard, or you can directly click with a mouse on the time icon. You can also click and hold and the time will automatically count repeatedly so you don't have to click multiple times and kill your finger. A day cycle is 2000 turns long complete with morning, day, evening, and night times. Some monsters will only spawn at night, and the time of day is very relevant to certain missions. 
Let's have a closer look at the combat now. Right now, I don't have any weapons equipped, but I can still attack with brute force and I can punch with an open hand. It's not very effective. I mean, you could do it, but it's not gonna work. There's also a bunch of different weapon classes. This is a dagger, they're pointy, and they can deal a lot of piercing damage. We have knuckles. Knuckles also do a lot of blunt damage, and depending on the knuckle's shape, also some piercing and slashing damage. And then we have swords. Swords are really good at dealing slashing damage because they're sharp. And they also do some piercing damage depending on the shape and type of sword. Then we have the mace type, with weapons such as maces and hammers. They primarily do blunt damage, but can also do some additional slashing and piercing damage if you have a pickaxe, for example. And here we have an axe. Axe do a lot of blunt and slashing damage. They don't really do any piercing damage. They are, however, super powerful and can attack multiple opponents at the same time. And then we have the Spear and Lance class. It's a two-handed weapon and cannot be dual wielded with any other weapons, so you can only have one. The stats are, however, much higher than any other weapon classes, so you can attack up to two enemies at the same time. You also will have a longer range, which means because of the Spear and Lance, you can attack opponents that are more than one tile away from you. Here, we also have shields. You can even dual wield shields, which means you can have two. You will perform physical attacks with these shields. They're not really strong, but your defenses will be really high. Shields also increase offense because you perform the attack with the shield, you just won't really see it that way in game. If an enemy is running away, this is a great time to use the spear and lance type to attack them while keeping a safe distance. Let's have a look at the axe weapons. The axes are super cool. You can attack multiple targets at the same time with them. Actually, we could kill three of them at the same time. Once our enemies run away, we have a couple options. For example, we could use a bomb. All we have to do is place the bomb and then kick it over to them and wait till they explode. Ha <laughs> ha, and boom he goes. Or, we could use a gun. There are three different types of guns in the game. We have a shotgun, rifles, and pistols. They're all a bit different and all use different ammunitions. Ammunition will vary in stats. Some is really cheap and not that great. And some of it is really good. Weapons are also going to have levels. A level one weapon is the weapon that I can equip at level one and so on and so forth. As you can see, a shotgun shoots in a cone. The range isn't that great, but we can get a couple targets at the same time. However, the aim's not that good with a shotgun. By shooting foes in the back, it'll also have the same effect as a backstabbing would by causing double damage. It's very effective for those monsters who decide to run away. You can also trigger bombs by shooting at them, which is really great because sometimes foes will also drop bombs. Some of the foes can even kick bombs back. So for example, the skeleton can kick a bomb back at me, which is really bad, but I can use this to my advantage. All right, and here we have the rifle. With the rifle equipped, I have a much longer range than a shotgun. This is really great. I can have a longer range and still attack multiple enemies at the same time. And then we have pistols. Pistols are high precision tools and have the greatest range of all of the ranged weapons. We also have plasma rifle and lasers that will require special batteries for ammunition. And of course you can dual wield pretty much anything in the game except a lance or a spear, but really anything else, totally dual wield it. Now let's have a look at the right side of the screen. You will see, as I attack foes, that I will have a combo counter. Right now, my combo is at 13, and the higher the combo gets, the higher the damage bonus I will give to my enemies. 
Right now, I have a plus 5% attack bonus. If I keep attacking, the combo will just keep growing and growing, and so will the bonus. Now, I have 10%, but I can get it all the way up to 100% and do twice as much damage. As you can see, there is some subtle particle effects on these tiles. If you step on them, you will see on the left side that I can get a terrain bonus stat. Some stats are super cool and useful, and some are negative. So, you know, be careful where you're stepping. If you play with a mouse, sometimes it's hard to walk behind an opponent, because if you try to click on the tile behind them, what you'll actually do is tell me to attack them. It can be dangerous sometimes. So, if you want, you can just click on a different tile and drag a path behind the foe, and then I will walk around them. And here are all my action slots. You can use them easily by clicking on them with the mouse or use the keyboard shortcuts. If you're gonna use a keyboard, you can use the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to trigger whatever you have in those selected slots. With the joypad, you can use the shoulder buttons to switch between the slots and use the secondary attack button to activate them. If I fell a tree on an opponent, he will get stunned. <laughs> You can use the environment to our advantage and protect your back or avoid getting surrounded. Very important. We also get to play with lots of different kinds of magics in the game. We have attack magic that can be aimed in any direction and then executed. We have, for example, the sleep magic, which can put my enemy to sleep and then you can walk behind him and stab him in the back. This can be super useful. We can use drain magic to regain health and then finish him off with some rained magic. Charm magic will turn the enemies against each other and I can use that to my advantage. And then I can teleport and teleport behind some foes and then stab them in the back, which is really useful. And then there's invisibility magic to sneak around and then I can stab them in the back. I can create some stone walls and ice walls to guard myself from being surrounded. I can also use magic to stop foes, which is super useful because they like to surround me and it's not fun. I can also use a teleport to get out of tight situations. Super handy. There is trap magic that also will deal damage when a stupid monster decides to step on it. You can also find magic in red treasure chests or by killing bosses in the survival or labyrinth mode. They will always drop magic, not acid, but magic. You can also find magic by carefully exploring areas in story mode. On the top right, you'll see the mini map. You can enlarge it to get a better view of what's going on. When you minimize it, all the doors that you have not yet entered will be blinking and marked in blue. If you try to enter a house, there will be a prompt, but you can totally turn that off if it super annoys you. There are also prompts for when you open shops that you can disable with the same setting if you don't want to be nagged. Shopping is super easy to do. Once the shop UI is open, you simply drag and drop the items you want to buy into your inventory. Here, you can select the quantity or just buy all or none. Look, I just bought a shovel. Selling will work the same way. You just drop it into the shop, select how many you would like to sell, and then sell them or sell nothing. There are different ways to use the shops. You can also right click on an item to open the command pop up and select the sell icon. You can do the same for buying. You just Open the command pop-up, select buy, and then select the quantity. The easiest way to sell is by double-clicking on the items and pressing enter if you're using a keyboard or the action button on a joypad. That's really all you have to do. Just select an item, double-click with mouse or hit enter, and it will directly let you buy or sell things. This way, you can also sell large quantities of items really quickly. There are tons and tons of vendors in the game, so make sure you explore them all. They all sell different kinds of things for crafting and also fun gear. All kinds of really useful stuff, really. 
We can also find a lot of really cool stuff by destroying crates and pots and opening treasure chests. If you find items on the ground, you can simply collect them by walking on the tile. You can right click on an item farther away from me to check it out. Sometimes you don't really want to collect junk, so you gotta know what it is. I can walk closer to it and open up the command pop-up for even more cool options. I can also consume it right off the ground and collect it if you'd like. Once you've had me pick up something and put it in my inventory, we can equip it. So, for instance, a health drink we can put in my action bar. It's an easier and quicker way for me to get to it. I can drink it simply by you clicking on it or by using the keyboard shortcuts. Or, if you use a joypad, just select the corresponding slot and I'll drink it. But notice on the right, that's the rage meter. The more I drink, the more alcohol I consume, the more my rage meter will fill up. You have to be really careful. But if I walk around, my rage meter will slowly go down by spending more turns. However, if you are careless and my rage meter gets full, I will go into a drunken rage and I will lose control for 20 turns. And during that time, you can't control me. It's really dangerous and it will be all your fault. I can also consume health items while they're in my inventory. All you have to do is use the command pop-up. Just right click on what you want me to consume and then choose consume it. It's pretty simple. As you can see, every time you make me drink, it will leave behind an empty bottle that can be used later for crafting. If you discard items, those items will be placed next to me. They are not lost, so do not worry. We can totally collect multiple pets in Dragonfin Soup. However, only two can help me at the same time. They'll follow me around, be my buddies, and help me in combat. Some of these pets will be more useful than others. Some will be stronger, some will be weaker. In that case, you know, shit happens, it might die. And when it dies, it'll be in my inventory marked as KO. When they're like this, they can't help me. But it's okay, don't worry. There's two ways that we can help heal these pets. The first way is we go back to town in Merlinheim and we talk to the vet and he can have them revived. The only problem is, is that he's expensive and kind of a prick. So the higher my level is, the more it's going to cost to have my pets revived. But don't worry, there is actually a free way to revive my pets. And we can use this multiple times without it costing me a penny. And here is the altar in dungeons. And this is the free way to revive your pets. All we have to do is give the pet to the altar. It sounds mean, but don't worry. Open the command pop-up and move the command or simply double click and you can select to revive it. And then once you revive my pet, he will be super stoked and ready to help me kick some ass. Altars also have a fun other purpose. Not only can we sacrifice our pets, but we can give them offerings. Sometimes you'll have to play around and see what the altar likes. This one liked the weapon that we sacrificed. And so he bestowed upon us 600 turns of increased attack power. There's a different kind of altar as well. This one's blue. You're going to have to figure out what kind of items it likes and then make your offerings accordingly. This one, he didn't like weapons, so he cursed us. And now I have a curse for 400 turns that will lower my defenses significantly. F to access the in-game UI, the user interface, there's an icon on the right side of the screen. Simply click on it or tap it with the touch screen or use the keyboard shortcut F1 and it will open the inventory. F2 will open my equipment F3 will show you all my awesome secret magic skills. And F4 will open crafting. F5 will show you my pets. F6 will show you the quest log. And F7, you can save and continue. All right, so let's check out my sweet inventory. As you can see, I have a bunch of different items and it can get very clustered and it's just a mess. So let's hit the sort button. The sort button will categorize and inventory everything in my inventory. Pressing it again will change the arrangement and you can also, if you want, manually move them around. 
All of my sweet, sweet weapons are all marked with a red background, and we will have items marked with an orange background that can be equipped but aren't meant for combat, like ammo and shovels and bombs and all bunch of cool shit. Pets are always going to be in dark blue, and all of my health and mana recovery items are in green. As you can see, there are a lot of items with a little green hammer icon in their corners. These items are for crafting. Some of them I can consume and not die, but really they're made for making cool shit. Then, of course, all of my sweet armor is going to be in a blue background. There is a shitload of items in this game, but thankfully I have lots of storage chests. The storage chests are all connected by magic, so basically it's one giant universal storage. It'll have three different tabs and offers lots of space. Moving items around in the storage is pretty simple. You just drag and drop an item and move it into the inventory. That's it. And look here, I'll move it back. You can also open the command pop-up and select the movement arrow to move it and move it back the same way. If you want, you can also manually drag and drop options if you play with a keyboard or joypad, but this isn't really recommended. This feature is usually really used for manual sorting and not for flipping and moving items. It just gets really annoying. The easiest way is simply just to double click. It's quick, it's easy, and you get to hit things a couple times. Double click or hit enter on your keyboard or the attack button. Simply select an item and hit enter and it will move right into the storage chest. It is quick and it's simple and it is magical magic. The storage chest will also have a sword button. It works the same way as the one in my inventory. This way you can keep everything clean and organized and handy. And here is where I keep all my cool shit, my equipment. As you can see, a lot of these slots are numbered. I have multiple slots. This one, this one's for my headgear, and this one is for my face. So I can wear masks and glasses and be mysterious. Then we have gloves. I have two slots for weapons, and two for bracelets, two for earrings, four for rings, one for capes and pants and shoes. Shoes and gloves, should always come in a pair. Question it if it doesn't. You cannot equip two different shoes. That would be an issue. We also have a slot for the gun and the ammunition, and then four slots for the shovel, the bomb, fishing rod, and its lore. Getting me my shit is super simple. All you gotta do, drag, drop, I've got it. If you select a weapon from my inventory, or whatever kind of cool gear you want to give me, the corresponding slot to where it goes to will flash, and that way you know exactly how to put it on me. If you want me to equip something, all you have to do is drag it to the slot, or use the right click to equip it with the command pop-up. The easiest way is to simply double click the item or hit enter on the keyboard or the attack button on the joypad. This way you can equip and unequip stuff with a single action. It's simple and easy. When you give me items to equip, such as weapons, you will have two weapons equipped that will automatically choose the weakest one to be replaced with the new one. If you select a weapon, you will see that the game also compares the item stats with all the equipped slots. It rotates the slots, like these four rings for example, and compares each ring to the one you have selected in my inventory or in the shop. It works the same way when you buy items. This way, you can always compare gear you want to buy for me and have equipped. The order of my weapons will not matter. You can give it in my left hand or in my right hand. It will do the same damage. As you can see, some items will have a little star icon, like this gun, for example. This means that this item is not discardable. You cannot throw it away and you cannot sell it. You can put it in storage though, because this is a signature weapon 
for me, so you cannot throw it away. Quest items will also be marked with a little Q icon, and you cannot sell or discard them either. Otherwise, you won't be able to complete my quest. And here are the action slots. If you're in my inventory, you can equip health items to my action slots as well. Equipping them is super easy. All you have to do, drag and drop, use the command pop-up, double click, hit enter, or the attack button. Unequipping them is equally as easy. And next we have all of my sweet skills and cool magic. This is located in a separate inventory and is equipped the same way. We, you can move stuff around, you can switch them, we can unequip them, really whatever is easiest and most comfortable for you. You can also use the mouse wheel to scroll through the slots if you play with a mouse and keyboard, but the game is playable with a slowly mouse option and a sole keyboard option. The best combination is with both, however. You can also use a manual movement feature. It can be accessed with the keyboard or joypad for manual sort. It's not recommended for equipping things, but it's possible. This is my handy dandy crafting UI, but we'll get back to this later. Here you can see all my pets UI. It's pretty simple to use. There are only two different pet slots you can equip at the same time. It'll show my pets levels, the experience they have, and what they require to evolve to the next level. Here you can also check out the stats of my pets. Once my pet is active, it'll appear next to me like magic. Sometimes if my pet's health is low, simply by unequipping him and disabling it, you will be able to prevent it from dying. And here is my quest log. This is the tab for the completed quests and active quests. Sometimes the text is longer, but that will be scrollable. At the top, you can see the name of the quests and the number of floor the dungeon has and the location of name of said dungeon. And of course, the mission giver, in case you forgot who that was, and then some brief information about the quest. Last is the save and continue menu. You can save and continue or save and quit or just quit without saving like a dummy. We do have an autosave feature in the game and it's available in all modes. Whenever you leave a map and enter a different map and if you see a loading screen, at this point, the autosave was performed. So if you're in a village and you went to a dungeon and you died, when you continue, you will load back in the village. If you have permadeath, i.e. hardcore mode, if you die, your save file will be obliterated because you killed me and that's what you deserve. In the tavern, Cock and Bull, in the first town, Merlinheim, you will meet Jin. He's your main guy. He has all of your fun story related missions, but you will also be able to meet plenty of other NPCs with missions for you. They'll have a giant question mark above their head. These are side missions. They're not relevant to the story, but you can get some really cool shit. All right, everybody, let's get crafty. NPCs will give you some simple crafting quests to help get you started. For instance, here we have a bunch of wood. Crafting is pretty simple. All you have to do is drag and drop the crafting supplies into the slots. Like I said, you may drag and drop, you can use the pop-up command, or simply you can double click. There are eight item slots here, but the combination has to be just right for crafting. You can use the clear button to clear all the slots, or you can clear them manually with just a double click. When you're ready to craft, simply hit the create button and bada bing, bada boom, you're crafting and creating. And now that we have a finished product and we have learned a new recipe, recipes marked with a green check mark means that you have all the ingredients needed for that recipe. And now you can use the autofill feature by double clicking, hitting enter, or the attack button on a joypad. Then you can simply craft it again. 
If you're feeling extra scientific today, you can also try experimenting to learn new recipes. For example, let's combine this egg and salt. <gasps> and now we have a boiled egg. You will also learn recipes and can repeat this process easily. If you look at the recipes, they will all be sorted by levels. The higher level recipes will be at the bottom of your list. If the crafting level is higher than your own, at a certain range, you won't be able to craft it. Here you see how much crafting experience you have and how much you will need for the next crafting level. You can sometimes, if you feel daring, craft a bit higher than your own level, but the success rate isn't, isn't all that great and it can result in breaking the materials. So, you know, be careful. You can also find recipes by destroying shit such as crates and pots, and sometimes you can even find them in treasure chests. You can also find new recipes as a reward for a mission. How sweet. All right, so let's take a look at fishing. But before we can fish, we're gonna have to go buy some equipment. We're gonna need lures and a fishing rod. There's only one type of fishing rod, but there's a couple different lures that we can get. I'm just gonna grab a couple now and then we can get things started. All right, now that we have the gear, let's equip up. Here's the fishing rod, there's the lure. All right, let's go start fishing. First, we have to find a little pond with a little fishing node. And then the fishing mini game will start. We select the depth, and then all we have to do is just follow the instructions. Rotate the reel in the correct direction before time runs out, and you fished. All right, sweet, we got a spotted eel. Depending on the depth and the lure, you can get different kinds of fish. Also, there are ponds in different kinds of regions, and certain regions will have fish that others do not. So, you'll have to experiment and explore to find out where you can get the fish. Also, each fish that you catch is going to be unique. It has a unique grade and weight. Let's have a look at that now. Alright, let's check out my spotted eels. As you can see, they're not the same. This is a grade D, and this is a grade C. The higher the grade, the best being A, and the higher the weight that it has, the more money I will receive when I sell it. And certain quests also require certain grades of fish. I can also dig in this game. Digging is quite simple. All you have to do is buy me a shovel, equip it, and then I can start digging around, and all you have to do is hit the action slot or press G on the keyboard. We can also get crafting material by destroying our environment, such as trees and stones. This way, we will always find useful materials for crafting. In some dungeons, you will find some small mini games, like this rune puzzle. You can activate them, but it has to be in the right combination. Don't worry, there's a stone that will tell you the correct combination. And if you complete it correctly, you'll get me a fun reward. Then we have two types of crystals. Activating this certain type of crystal will give you 25 turns to find the matching pair. Once you find the matching crystal, activate it and you'll get me my reward. Then there is the crystal that is floating on a chain. It's a loop crystal. If you create a loop that encloses the crystal, it will reward you. You can experiment with it if you'd like. If you enclose objects such as trees, rocks, really whatever, within the circle, they will be converted into fun items. You can even entrap our foes inside this loop. It will stun them or deal damage. There are also some other blocks that you can interact with, such as this metal block. It's fairly indestructible, but we can destroy it with bombs. And then we have this stone block, which is marked with blue. It can only be pushed once, so if you make a mistake, you can't fix it. Sometimes some puzzles will require the usage of those blocks. For example, here we have a gap we cannot cross over to get the golden key, so we have to move away some of the blocks. 
There are blocks marked with greens, and they can be pushed easily. They're usually used to close gaps, and they can be stacked as well. As you can see, we push one block on top of the other and close the gap. Now, I can get my key. There is another type of block that can be moved only once, but they have to be moved in a certain direction. They usually have a little blue icon that indicates the direction they have to be moved in. You can also find red runes that can trigger traps and give rewards. In many dungeons, I'll encounter random vendors. Make sure to always check out their inventory, as they have some really cool ass shit that you can't find anywhere else in Asherah. Also, sometimes you'll be able to find these really cool spike balls, and we can kick them to my enemies and deal damage. It's pretty sweet. Sometimes you can meet some really friendly NPCs that will not join your party, but will fight on their own. They will steal my kills. Watch them. Aside from food and drinks, you can eat pretty much everything that you can remotely fit into your mouth. So you could eat an earring if you wanted. It's not recommended. It'll kind of give me some damage. Eating some things will be fatal to me. I'd appreciate it if you didn't do it, but if you're feeling so cocky and decide to make me eat a shovel, it will kill me and I will come and haunt you. I'll also be able to encounter many teleport platforms and teleportation traps. They're really freaking annoying, but they do come in handy. To unlock new characters and my friends, you have to play Labyrinth Mode. In total, you can unlock seven different characters. When you unlock one, you have to use the new character in order to unlock the next new character. In some rare cases, it can happen that an item that you need is spawned on the same tile that is occupied by an altar or an NPC. It's not possible to collect it because you can't step on it. And if you click on it, it will trigger the UI or dialogue. In this case, simply use the command pop-up to collect the item by right-clicking or pressing the corresponding button on keyboard or joypad. As you progress in story mode, you will unlock more and more locations on the world map. Some are persistent and can be revisited whenever you like. Those are marked in green. And some are temporal. 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 Tempora. Shit. Some are temporary, and these are marked in red. Completing or failing a mission will remove the location from the world map. Sometimes, while traveling from one location to another, you will experience random encounters. You can avoid conflict by paying off the bandits, or you can fight your way out. Okay, let's have a closer look at the stats. Strength. This is the base value that is used for melee attacks. Shield defense. This defense is the base value used for defense against melee attacks. It is used in calculation directly related to the damage dealt by the pure strength damage. This is power. This is the power that is the base value that is used in calculations for ranged attacks. The bow defense is the base value of defense against ranged attacks like guns. It is used in calculation directly related to the damage dealt by the pure power damage. Unlike melee weapons, the firearms do not use most of the hero's stats other than power, luck, and aim. The weapons have their own stats and the ammunition adds additional stats to the ranged attack. A character at a higher level will not necessarily do more damage with the low level firearm. There are, however, a variety of firearms available in a wide level range. Also, some gear can add additional power bonus that is taken into account when calculating the damage dealt by firearms. Blunt Attack This value adds blunt damage to your melee attack. Piercing Attack This value adds piercing damage to your melee attack. Slashing Attack 
This value adds slashing damage to your melee attack. And on the right side, you can see the corresponding defense values against blunt, piercing, and slashing damage. Certain weapons are better at dealing certain damage type. Daggers, for example, usually do higher piercing damage, while hammers usually deal a lot of blunt damage. Certain armor types give better protection against piercing damage, some is better against blunt or slashing damage. Basically, you can see the blunt piercing and slashing damage as additional damage dealt on top of the brute force damage calculated by the strength value. Next we have the water, earth, air, and fire element attack values with the color crossed sword icons. These are the values of the elemental attack damage. On the right side, you can see the corresponding elemental defense values with the color shield icons. Elemental damage is not exclusive to magic, although magic damage relies heavily on these values with using a special formula. Weapons, armors, and projectiles also can have additional elemental damage and defense. Luck. This value is a summary of three other values that determine the chance for counter strike, critical hit, and stun. Those values are not hidden but merely summarized in this luck value. The luck value of the attacker and the target both determine the chance of the critical hit, getting stunned, but also being able to dodge an attack. The formula takes some other values into account as well, such as skill and agility, as well as strength and defense, to determine if a hit is possible at all, or if any damage is dealt. Some gear increases the luck value. Skill value determines the ability of the attacker to land a hit. The higher the skill, the more likely you are not to miss. Aim is the ability that determines the ability of landing a hit with a ranged weapon. Agility is a value that determines the chance of dodging a melee attack. Skill of the attacker and agility of the one being attacked influence the chance of landing a hit or miss. Dodge is a value that determines the chance of dodging a ranged attack. Aim of the attacker and dodge of the one being attacked influence the chance of landing a hit or miss. There are three weapon types, shotguns, rifles, and handguns. The main difference is the range and spread. Shotguns, for example, usually have a short range but a wide cone and deal a lot of area damage, while handguns have a long range and better aim. You will find a variety of melee weapons that when used perform multiple attacks or inflict multiple hits with a single strike. Regardless of the number of attacks or hits the weapon only uses one turn, dual wielding two weapons also will only use one turn. It is important to know that, for example, having two swords with similar stats, the sword that performs multiple attacks does not do more damage than the sword that performs a single attack. Multiple hits or attacks have the advantage of having a higher chance of dealing a critical hit or to stun the opponent. Thank you for watching and checking out how to play my super rad, amazingly tasty Dragonfin Soup. Be sure to check out the forums at dragonfinsoup.com. Our community is really awesome and has gathered a lot of useful information like a complete recipe list with over 500 recipes and other fun and useful tips and tricks. Make sure you check it out. Thanks for watching and I can't wait to go on an adventure with you.